those things, all those things that you're worthy of, Lord. We love you, we worship you, and we rest in you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, everyone. It's nice to see you. Thank you for being here and for coming out. Can you feel your toes and fingers this morning? That's good. This is, this is crazy. Do you know that in Dallas, they're going to get six inches of snow today, so God bless them. Um, <laughs> Anyway, thank you, and thank you, uh, worship team. We're so thankful for you all and the way you serve so wonderfully, humbly, faithfully, week after week. Our media team up there in the uh, vast reaches of the balcony, we're thankful for them. Um, our guest ministry team, they're greeting you at the door. Our parking team, Mark McCann, the trustees, they keep our parking lot clean. Can you help me just thank these people? They're so wonderful. I'm grateful, really, really am. So many, and I've only mentioned a few of our teams that serve so wonderfully behind the scenes and help us open these doors and keep this ministry uh, viable and comfortable and hopefully an encouragement to you and your families in these days. Uh, join me, if you would, back in the um, New Testament letter, Hebrews. Now we're going to go to Hebrews chapter 7. We made our way through the interminable chapter 6, and we'll be here for chapter 7 this morning. And uh, thank you for your enthusiasm and your encouragement, your prayers, and uh, your participation in the ministry of God's Word as we've made our way through this great le letter. Um, let me read the passage that I'd like to share with you this morning, and then we'll go back and make some comments uh, together and hopefully apply them to our lives and hearts. Starting with verse 1 of uh, Hebrews chapter 7. This Melchizedek was king of the city of Salem and also a priest of God most high. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. Then Abraham took a tenth of all he had captured in battle and gave it to Melchizedek. The name Melchizedek means king of justice, and king of Salem, which means king of peace. There is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever, re resembling the Son of God. Consider then how great this Melchizedek was, even Abraham. The great patriarch of Israel recognized this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. Now the law of Moses required that the priests, who are descendants of Levi, must collect a tithe from the rest of the people of Israel, who are also descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, uh, who was not a descendant of Levi, collected a tenth from Abraham, and Melchizedek placed a blessing upon Abraham, the one who had already received the promises of God. And without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. The priests who collect these tithes are men who die. So Melchizedek is greater than they are because we are told that he lives on. In addition, we might even say that these Levites, the, one who, the ones who collect the tithe, paid a tithe to Melchizedek when their ancestor Abraham paid a tithe to him. For although Levi wasn't born yet, the seed from which he came was in Abraham's body when Melchizedek collected the tithe from him. So if the priesthood of Levi, on which the law was based, could have achieved the perfection God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood with a priest in order of Melchizedek instead of the order of Levi and Aaron? And if the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed to permit it. 
For the priest we are talking about belongs to a different tribe whose members have never served at the altar as priests. What I mean is, our Lord came from the tribe of Judah, and Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. Now, there are few more random uh, passages in all of Scripture, I feel, than the one we'll consider today. In fact, the one I just read. Uh, It feels a bit bizarre. The writer closed out, um, as we looked at last time, a section on hope, a hope that resides in the promise of heaven, which is assured to those like Abraham who believe God. That's the promise. Salvation and the assurance of eternal life comes down to the issue of faith. That's the whole point of this passage and this message in its entirety. Chapter 6 culminates really in almost symphonic climax with the statement that Jesus has already gone to heaven. He's there. He's passed through and now serves believers as our high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. This is where he introduces this this image, this illustration, this individual um, which he develops here in this passage known as Melchizedek. Uh, And by the way, um, apart from this passage in Hebrews um, and in Genesis 14, Melchizedek is mentioned only one other time in the scriptures and that's in the psalm, Psalm 110. So here he is. And he's part of canon. He's part of eternal revelation here as this writer lifts him out as an example. By the way, these passages, not all of them in Hebrews, but um, several, um, including this one today, are arranged in couplets. You can see how influenced this writer was uh, by his understanding and probably his immersing in his own mind in Hebrew poetry. And so there's a way in which you can kind of organize your thoughts and study uh, by looking at these couplets, these verses. Um, A couplet's simple. Roses are red, violets are blue. Would you like to be my valentine? I sure hope you do. That's a couplet. It's terrible poetry, but that's a couplet. That's the idea. So uh, embedded in some of these passages is a little bit of a key that helps us unlock um, the more difficult passages, like this one. They're arranged in these orders. Now, let's look at this Old Testament story that this writer refers to, this Melchizedek, who was the king of the city of Salem and also a priest of God Most High. When Abraham was returning home after winning a great battle against the kings, Melchizedek met him and blessed him. So hold your place in Hebrews 7, and let's turn to the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 14. Okay, Genesis 14. And we'll take a look at this. This may be a brand new uh, story for some of you this morning, which is wonderful. By the way, um, I kind of liken it to, you know, maybe a Netflix series or something. It really has that kind of feel to it, kind of a a Lord of the Rings, these kind of epic battles. And Abraham is at the center of this one, starting um, in Genesis chapter 14. So as you know, God called Abram. He called him to leave his place and go to a land uh, which he would show him. It was a land of promise. This is the word that Abraham initially believed, that God would be faithful, that God would bless him. And he took his whole family, including his nephew Lot and all of Lot's family, uh, on this trek, uh, on this journey. Um, so that, that's kind of the, uh, the, the context of this story. But they got to a place where the land uh, on which they were traveling could not sustain both um, Abram's family as well as Lot's family and all of their herds and, and livestock, etc. And so Abram said, look, we've got to separate. It was a practical matter. And uh, this is in uh, Genesis chapter 13. And the summary of it was, is that Abram graciously allowed Lot to take a choice, uh, look out across this territory, and it was lush, it was green, it was rich soil, it was was a beautiful uh, piece of ground, and you can have that, or you can come this way and have this. It was much more arid, it was rugged, it wasn't ideal, 
um, for the raising of livestock uh, crops, etc. And so Lot took a look. He, he, he took his uncle up on this choice and he said, well, I'll, I'll take this. I'll take this plot, this area. Um, this is a, a paraphrase, of course. And it was the Fertile Plains. That's in verse 10 of chapter 13. But it also happened to be in the region of Sodom and Gomorrah. <clears throat> That's what Lot chose for himself, verse 11 of chapter 13. The whole Jordan Valley was east of them. If you ever get a chance to go to Israel, maybe some of you have. If you look across the Jordan Valley, it's, it's beautiful. It's green. Most of the roses, for instance, that are in uh, the grocery stores um, today, at least a good percentage of them, right here in LaGrange, have been flown over from the Jordan Valley in Israel. They've come from the Middle East. It's lush. It's gorgeous. It's beautiful. Um, some of you are going, I forgot the roses. So there's a little reminder. Um, but nonetheless, these families separated. And so verse 12 of Genesis 13, Abram settled in the land of Canaan. Lot moved his tents to a place near Sodom and settled among the cities of the plain. But the people of this area, that is to say where Lot had set up camp, were extremely wicked and constantly sinned against the Lord. Okay? Uh, like California. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I just want to make sure you're awake this morning because it was cold. After Lot had gone, the Lord said to Abram, look as far as you can see in every direction, north and south, east and west. This is the end of Genesis 13. I'm giving all this land as far as you can see to you and your descendants. A permanent possession. This is a reiteration of the promise. And I will give you so many descendants that like the dust of the earth, they cannot be counted. So go walk through the land in every direction. For I'm giving it to you. So Abram moved his camp to Hebron and settled near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. There he built another altar to the Lord. He worshipped the Lord. Isn't that great? Now, here's verse, chapter 14. War broke out in the region. And this is where I think this would be a fun uh, screenplay. King Aramphel of Babylonia, King Arioch of Elatsar, King Kedorlaomer of Elam, and King Tidal of Golem. Doesn't that sound like a great cast? Um, they fought against King Bera of Sodom, King Bersha of Gomorrah, King Shinab of Adma, King Shemaber of Zeboaim, and the King of Bela, also known as Zoar. The second group of kings joined forces in the Sidim Valley, that is the Valley of the Dead Sea. So that's to the south. Twelve years they had been subject uh, to King Kedorlaomer, but in the thirteenth year they got their act together and they rebelled against him. One year later, Kedorlaomer and his allies arrived and defeated the Rephaites at Ashtaroth Karnaim, the Zuites, the Zuzites, I should say, at Ham, the Emites at Shabbat Keriathaim. And the Horites at Mount Seir. We were going to ask for a volunteer to read the passage this morning, but everyone declined. Then they turned back and came to En Mishpat, now called Kadesh. I think someone just said, let's call this place Kadesh because no one wants to say En Mishpat. And conquered all the territory of the Amalekites and also the Amorites living in Hatzatzon Tamara. Then the rebel kings of Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, and Bela, also called Zeor, prepared for battle in the Valley of the Dead Sea. They fought against King K of Elam, King T of Goim, King A of Babylon, and King A of Eleazar. Four kings against five. As it happened, the Valley of the Dead Sea was filled with tar pits. Isn't this epic? I mean, you would watch this, wouldn't you, on Netflix? Most you shouldn't watch on Netflix, but I think you should watch this. The rest escaped into, people fell into these tar pits. The army of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled. Some fell into the tar pits while the rest escaped into the mountains. The victorious invaders then plundered Sodom and Gomorrah and headed for home, taking with them all the spoils of war and the food supply and lot. Abram's nephew, his wife, his children, his grandchildren, his servants, his hired hands. 
all of them who lived near Sodom and carried off everything he owned. How about that? So now he is captive of this marauding band of who knows who. And they've been taken captive, every one of them, everyone in their families. But, I love this, one of Lot's men escaped and reported everything to Abram, the Hebrew, who was living near the oak grove belonging to Mamre, uh, the, the Amorite. Mamre and his relatives, Eshcol and Aner, were Abram's allies. When Abram heard that his nephew Lot had been captured, now watch this. He mobilized the 318 trained men who had been born into his house. So Abram gets this report that Lot and his family, so his nephew and his grandnieces and grandnephews and all of these people had been taken captive by these, the, 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 these marauding kind of kings and their warriors. And he hears this message and so he calls up the trained men that are within uh, the authority of his household. Now that's a whole nother sermon series. But that's remarkable, isn't it? Um, that he had that at his disposal. Um, then, he didn't call a prayer meeting. He, he, he went out in pursuit. He pursued Kedola Amar's army until he caught up with him at Dan. Now that's all the way to the north. Dan is all the way to the north of where uh, Lot was originally captured and where Abram was encamped. So he catches up with him at, at verse 15. There he divided his men and attacked during the night. Kedar Laamar's army fled, but Abram chased them as far as Haboth, north of Damascus. Now they're in Syria, chasing after these guys. Abram recovered all the goods that had been taken, and he brought back his nephew Lot with his possessions and all the women and other captives. Now, that's the kind of uncle you want on your team, right? That's terrific. What a great story. That's the context for Hebrews 7, all that had transpired. Now, Abram returned from his victory. So this is a, a victorious return back with his, all of his relatives and everyone who had been taken captives. Now they are, have been set free and they're returning back uh, to their encampment, encampment in Hebron um, and all of his allies. And during that return, the king of Sodom went out to meet him, that is to say, to the valley of Shiva. And Melchizedek, here it is, verse 18, the king of Shalom, or Salem, probably the area of Jerusalem, although there's a lot of different interpretations, he's also the priest of God Most High, brought Abram some bread and wine. So this is the encounter. After this epic battle, this heroic rescue event, enormously successful, He's on his way back as the victor, and this, this king and this priest of the Most High God, Melchizedek, meets him on the road and brings him bread and wine, which is a, a customary replenishing um, meal for the troops, for the, for, the, for, the, for the victorious returning troops. That's, that, that's the idea. So he goes out to meet him. Melchizedek... Verse 19, blessed Abram with this blessing. Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has defeated your enemies for you. Wow, what a marvelous perspective on what had just transpired. In the event that Abram or anyone in that party had gotten a little too big for their own shoes or somehow had become a bit more convinced of their own resourcefulness because of what had just transpired, here comes this um, 
priest of the Most High, literally out of nowhere, brings bread and wine and blesses them with this blessing. Blessed be Abraham by God Most High. So this, he's orthodox. <laughs> Creator of heaven and earth. And blessed be God Most High. He blesses the Lord who has defeated your enemies for you. Now this is Abram. And he's receiving this blessing from this priest of the Most High God. Now then Abram gave Melchizedek a tenth of all the goods he had recovered. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give back my people who were captured, but you may keep for yourself all the goods you have recovered. Abram replied to the king of Sodom, I solemnly swear to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth. It's almost verbatim from the blessing he just heard that I will not take so much as a single thread or sandal thong from what belongs to you. Otherwise, you might say I am the one who made Abram rich. Wow, whence cometh greatness like that? I will accept only what my young warriors have already eaten, and I request that you give a fair share of the goods to my allies, Anar, Eshkol, and Mamre. Isn't that great? That's the story. That's the story. That this writer lifts um, out of the, the files of the minds of, of these Hebrew Christians in order to illustrate a point, not about Abram, not about Melchizedek, but about Christ. The greater always blesses the lesser. Always. Um, the, I mean, Melchizedek, according to Hebrews 7, is the, is the king. He, he is, he's, he's prominent wherever this was. Uh, he's the king of Salem. He's also the priest of the Most High God. Um, he has a prominent spiritual ministry on behalf of God. Um, and his name, the scriptures say in, in Hebrews chapter 7, is king of righteousness, also king of peace. You can immediately begin to see uh, the, this argument unfolding, the correlation uh, to Christ. And he's great. That's the idea. Uh, the writer says in verse 4 of Hebrews 7, Consider then how great this Melchizedek was. We saw that. He, he's great in his humility. He's great in his, um, his, his generosity, his gesture toward Abram in coming out and supplying bread and wine to all his troops. He's great in his representation of the Most High God. He's great in offering a blessing uh, to Abram and to all of his family. You see that. Um, but yet, Abraham, the great patriarch, see what he's doing with his, with his words here of Israel, recognized this by giving him a tenth of what he had taken in battle. So Abram responds in humility and offers him a tithe. He gives a tithe to this priest. It's a response of humility. It's wonderful the kind of exchange. And then he develops this that the law required, Mo, uh, the law of Moses required that the priests who are descendants of e uh, Levi must collect a tithe from the rest of the people of Israel who are also descendants of, of Abram. But Melchizedek, was, he wasn't even a Levite. The Levites weren't even on the planet when this, when this uh, event occurred. In fact, he goes on to say that the Levites were literally in, kind of in the loins of Abraham. They were in his seed, but they weren't alive yet. But yet the principle of the law of Moses was in place. It was eternally in place in the mind of God. But Melchizedek wasn't a Levite. But yet he was a priest of the Most High God. And he was great in all of these ways. And so he blesses Abram. That's the idea. And that's why he says in verse 7, of course, and with what, without question, the person who has the power to give a blessing is greater than the one who is blessed. By the way, in practical speaking, that's why we ought to weigh our words, especially those of us 
who are in positions of authority or power over someone else, whether you're an employer or uh, a parent um, or an older sibling or a mentor, a coach. It doesn't matter if you have a certain purview uh, of authority, if you are in a place uh, of being over someone else, you, you have great power in your words. You can either choose to bless someone and set them on a course of remarkable effectiveness and success, or what comes out of your mouth in any given moment could actually um, damage them for the rest of their days. This is a blessing. And the, the, the greater always blesses the lesser. And that's what happened in this story. That's the point of this illustration. But yet he's building, he's kind of warming to his point, I should say. And that's why he gives the example of the Levites. That's how it was set up in the law. But they weren't even onto the planet. Um, but they were in Abram's loins. So through Abraham, even the Levites gave to Melchizedek. That's, uh, that's kind of what he's alluding to. Now let's just look at kind of some of the comparisons. If you have a copy of the sermon notes, they're here for you. But just first of all, Melchizedek is described in verse 1 as a priest of the Most High God. He's also described that way in Genesis chapter 14. Jesus Christ is described as the exalted Son of God, Philippians 2.9. You see that comparison. So one is a priest of the Most High God, Jesus Christ, who he's going to he's described as our eternal high priest, is, is known and described as the exalted Son of God. Philippians chapter 2, verse 9. Melchizedek, his name means king of justice, king of righteousness. Jesus, in the annals of the prophets, is described as the prince of peace, the everlasting father, mighty God, Isaiah chapter 9. Um, there's no recorded lineage according to this passage, uh, verse 3 of Hebrews 7. A perpetual priesthood. Now, you need to know that Melchizedek is not still alive. He's not kind of wandering around the Judean wilderness. It, 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 that doesn't mean that. What it means is there's no record. There's no birth certificate. There's no lineage. Okay, so in that way, he's like Jesus... <laughs> who has an eternal ministry, Psalm 45, that's the idea. And all these other passages that refer to Jesus' ministry, his priestly ministry, as being eternal, that's the idea. He received gifts from Abram, we saw that in Genesis 14 and in Hebrews 7, 4 through 5. Jesus, even as an infant, received gift from, gifts from kings, Matthew 2, 11. Now, what is the fundamental question of this passage? It's in verse 11. If the priesthood of Levi on which the law was based could have achieved the perfection God intended. This reference to perfection, by the way, is the perfection of righteousness. So here's the question. If the law and the system of priests set up the Levitical system, that is to say, on which the law was based could have achieved ultimate righteousness, which God intended, why did God need to establish a different priesthood? In other words, he's back to his early argument, his contention at the beginning of this letter, is that the law, though valuable, and instructive in leading us to a knowledge of the truth and of our own need for redemption is good and gracious. It is wholly insufficient in bringing us to God. He's back to it. There was a need for another line of priests like Melchizedek who wasn't a Levite, who existed apart from the law, 
but yet who represented the Most High God and had no beginning and no end, had the prospect of an eternal ministry on behalf of those who trusted the truth revealed by God. There was a need for another priesthood, a priesthood like Melchizedek, but not even Melchizedek was sufficient enough, but there needed to be a greater priest. A priesthood that is unchanged. Verse 12, and if the priesthood is changed, the law must also be changed to permit it. For the priest we are talking about belongs to a different tribe whose members have never served the altar as priests. The tribe of Judah. Our Lord came from the tribe of Judah. And Moses never mentioned priests coming from that tribe. It's not in the system. Uh, that's why, if you go back to Hebrews 4, starting in verse 14, the writer says this, So then, we have a great high priest. He's not a Levite. He, he has no kind of credible lineage other than the fact that he is the Son of God. And he has already entered heaven. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly then to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. For he faced all the same testings we do, yet without sin. That's why we can come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive His mercy. That's a blessing. And we will find grace to help us. That's a blessing in those times when we need it most. The greater always blesses the lesser. And that blessing comes by faith. So, this high priest, this eternal high priest, is able and desires to credit to you, listen, his righteousness, to make you right before God. So, Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for sin, so that we could be made right with God through Christ. He's also able and desires to give you a supernatural peace, a peace with God. That is to say, you are no longer an object of God's wrath because of the righteousness of Christ, which is imputed to you by faith. And it's a peace of mind, it's a peace of heart. It's a peace that the world cannot give. John chapter 14. These are the words of Jesus himself. Paul wrote to the Ephesian believers, Ephesians chapter 2. Christ himself is our peace. It's not a peace the world can give. It's not a peace that financial security can, can offer. It's not that kind of peace. It's a supernatural peace that is delivered and kept for by this eternal high priest who is Jesus Christ. That's the idea. That's the significance of this passage. He's saying, look, you saw how this happened. He pulls up a file in the minds of these Jewish believers. You click on Abram in the mind of any Jewish person, and it's going to bring up a vivid file. Abram, I've got it. Genesis 14, click on that. This opens up. Click on Melchizedek. This, they had it. We go, Melchizedek, Kedial, Amar, Goyai, what? Not these people. This resonated with their souls. But yet, this one in whom your hope is firmly anchored is greater than all of that. 
because he is able. He's not only able, he is anxious to credit to you his righteousness. He is able and anxious to give you a supernatural peace. So what's our response? I'll give you three. Three thoughts. First, stop. Stop. Stop striving to fix your life on your own. Just stop. Stand down from all that frenzied anxiousness and preoccupation and self-determination to try and figure this on your own. It's futile. Second, Once you've stopped striving, listen. Over and over, this writer is going to say, today, if you hear his voice, open your ears. Listen to God's voice when he speaks to you about you, about your situation, about your future, about what is true about what's going on in your mind, in the attitude of your heart about someone else or some sort of thing that has you on the ropes. Whatever it is, stop first. Stop, just stop, <laughs> and then listen. How do you listen? You open God's Word. You listen to the voice of His Word through His Spirit. You listen through the voice of those God has put into your life, godly, mature, gracious people who can speak truth into your life. It'll always align with Scripture. It'll be, it'll be true. It'll be spot on. It'll also be gracious. So listen. And finally, trust. Trust what He says and submit to His will and purposes for you. Because this high priest, who is the greater, the greatest, the exalted one, he wants to bless you. He doesn't want to, like, thump you. Now, sometimes you need, I, I need to be thumped, right? Kind of the old, in the back of the head. But he wants to bless you. That's, that's part of his eternal ministry. That's what, a, that's what a high priest does. He pronounces a blessing. He wants to bless you. And in fact, Paul says he has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in Christ. Us being here this morning is just the tip of the iceberg of the blessing our eternal high priest has for you in Christ. So, Trust Him. Trust His Word. And then submit to His will and purpose for you. And Jesus told Nicodemus, you know, that smart, very resourceful, very prominent, extremely intelligent, a man of great means and curiosity and imagination, with a very simple query about, I really want to experience it all. Jesus said, You got to start over. You must be born again. Everything's got to be made new. You need a new heart. You need a new mind. You need new affections. You need new priorities. You need a new will. You need everything.
You must be born again. Trust what he says. Let's Melchizedek. Let's pray. Well, Lord, as you know, this word is more for me than anyone this morning. And we've been talking about that. But I pray, Lord, for my brother or sister here today who just needs encouragement. And maybe even a rescue plan of their own. For someone to just come to their rescue this morning. Because they're captive. Captive to the enemy's relentless assaults. Mental assaults, emotional assaults. They're bound by fear. Bitterness, hurt, whatever, Lord. You are the great deliverer. I pray you will be their Savior and their God today. And a gracious high priest. Bless us, Jesus, bless us. Let no one leave this place who has not felt your gracious touch and blessing today. We receive you and all that you have offered to us. We receive it by faith. We trust you. Help us in these areas where we are struggling to let go. Help us help each other. We ask it in your exalted name and for your sake.